things, beauty will be seen and our faith will become sight. Take your Bibles this morning, please. Turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles, chapter number seven. And there's been an underlying theme that I think the Lord has kind of been putting in the service, and I think the message might highlight it. We're going to read just a few verses here, and we'll start at verse number twelve. We'll go to verse number fourteen, and then we'll. Uh, We'll continue on. And the word of God says in verse number 12 of chapter number 7, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place, Jerusalem, um, to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, verse number 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. And underline this in your Bible, and will heal their land. And will heal their land. I, I don't know about you, but as you study the Bible, have you ever studied the prayers of some of the great men in this book? This morning, I, I want us to consider the prayer of one of the, probably the most powerful Israelite king that ever ruled. That would be King Solomon. And it's interesting, when you study this chapter, he, he makes a very interesting request. After uh, 1 Kings 8, he finishes the construction. We've got our city people here. Um, he finishes the construction of, if you will, a 30 to $150 billion building. The inside of it is overlaid with 20 tons of gold. Can you imagine a building project like that? The, the meetings you would have, how much are you spending? Oh, God, you know, but Solomon, Solomon builds this massive temple to his God, and he sacrifices 120,000 sheep, 22,000 bulls. The Bible says that Solomon blesses the Lord, and then he dedicates the building with prayer. And I want to encourage you, if you have time later, read 1 Kings 8. It's an interesting prayer. But in this prayer, he makes a very specific request to God. He asks that if Israel is beaten by their enemies because they've, they've fallen into sin, but if they turn back to the Lord and if they confess his name, if they pray and they make supplication, then he asks, them to hear, he asks God to hear from heaven to forgive their sin and bring them back into the land. And at the end of this prayer, it's interesting, God fills the temple with his Shekinah glory, and it is so powerful of a presence, it literally outs the priest, it pushes them out the door like an explosion, and then fire from heaven comes down and licks up and eats up all of the sacrifices on the brazen altar, and that fire burned and burned for hundreds and hundreds of years thereafter, a miraculous thing. But in our text, we read that God visited Solomon by night in person, and I believe in the person of the pre incarnate Christ. And he told him that he'd meet his request. Aren't you glad when you pray through and you're burned about something? It's almost like the Lord gives you a peace and says, it's going to be okay. And you know, you've given you, when you give something to the Lord and you're like Hannah and you're praying and you're praying and you pray, you don't even have words and you're like Hezekiah and you spread it before the Lord. And then he gives you that peace. It's okay. I've got it. And imagine Solomon's, actually what's interesting is it had been 13 years since Solomon had prayed that prayer. The Bible says that after he completed his home, that's when the Lord showed up and said, I've heard your request. God made a promise to his people, Israel, to hear them from the temple, from heaven. When his people would become entangled with sin, then and when they would forsake God in his temple and they would be judged for it, if his people would turn back, God would be merciful to revive them as a nation. You know, can I tell you, I read this, and this was written around about the 10th century B.C., and don't, don't let anybody tell you B.C.E. They take, they take Christ out of history. B.C., that's all you're going to hear up here. But 10th century B.C., this was written. But can I tell you, I believe that this promise carries the same power today. I believe the God who made this promise is the same God who rules the heavens today. He is the same God, the Bible says, who resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. Right. 
We the saved, those in Christ who become entangled with sin. We who forsake God and his church and are judged because of it. If we come back to him, God will be merciful to revive us right. too. And here's what I really want us to understand. If you look at that last verse, I had you underline it. He says, and heal, and will heal their land. I don't know about you, but when I studied that verse and I really considered the promise, that tore me up on the inside. To think, to think about God bringing healing and how much hurt there is. You know, if you study the historical books, and let me make an announcement. On Wednesday nights, we have a Bible study where we're actually going through every book of the Old Testament. You don't know anything about Chronicles? Show up this Wednesday, and we'll teach you about it. But if you study Second Chronicles, what you find time and time again was there were, there were points in Israel's history when the law was completely forgotten. When evil reigned, when little babies were sacrificed in the fires of Molech. When blood ran in the streets, times of rampant corruption and false teachers, the nation was fractured in a civil war. Can I tell you, tribe against tribe. People hated each other. They couldn't get along. This was a, an open spiritual wound that no politician can mend. Let me tell you, these people cannot mend spiritual problems. All they can do is ask God to do the mending. Amen. Aren't you glad that you don't have to mend anything spiritually here, right? You just have to keep the order, right? But no politician could, no king could fix the, the open sore of sin. Can I tell you with heavenly boldness this morning, I believe we live in like times. Tribe against tribe. Truth has fallen, the Bible says, in the streets. There's, there, there, is, there is rampant idolatry, rampant false teaching. People have forgotten the law, and this country is broken in need of healing. This great land is beaten and bloody, and sadly, the church is retreating. God's people are giving up and giving in. We need God to heal this land again. We need another great awakening to heal the festering wounds of sin. And with God's help this morning, I want to preach on that very topic of spiritual healing. The title of my message comes from our text, Heal Our Land. Heal Our Land. Let's approach the throne of grace together, and let's ask God to bless his word this morning, okay? Lord, I come to you this morning, and Lord, I am nothing honestly i'm nothing i am a an unworthy vessel I, most times i live my life as a vessel of dishonor not of honor lord i don't deserve to be behind the pulpit god but i ask that you would cleanse me god that you would fill me with your holy spirit that you would give me wisdom god that you would help me to to, to preach thus saith the lord with holy boldness and lord i pray that you would touch hearts in this church this morning God, for the Christian who needs reviving and for the sinner who needs saving. God, I pray that you would draw as your will states. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm going to give you, for those of you taking notes this morning, I'm going to give you three points con uh, concerning the healing of our land. Number one, I want us to consider the people addressed here. The people addressed here. Look at your Bible here. Who, who is God making the promise to? Who, who are the people, who are the parties involved in this promise? Notice God says, if my people, which are called by what? My name. Can I tell you this morning, God's talking to his people. God's talking to his children. He's talking, he's talking to his party. Now you may say, well, preacher, I just believe everybody's a child of God. That's not Bible. Let me give you some Bible here this morning. I've, you know, I've heard some people come to my door trying to get me to come to their church, and they've said, we're all, we're all God's children. But the Bible teaches that if we're not saved, we are of our father, the devil. That's John 8, 44. If we're not saved, Ephesians 2, 2 says, naturally, we are the children of disobedience. And verse number 3 says, we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You know how you know you're not God's people? Because you're naturally inclined against the things of God. You've not been changed. You've not been born again. You've never been made a new creature and by nature your inclination is to go away from god and not to come to god you've never been changed so god's not talking to the lost out there god's not talking to the the pseudo the unbeliever who, who may show up to church but they've never trusted christ god is talking to his people well you say well preacher who are god's people let me let me give you a definition those who have realized their unpayable debt of sin those who have trusted the death of christ to pay that sin 
sin and to reconcile them to a holy God. They are those who believe that Jesus, that God has raised up Jesus um, to bring eternal life, and they have placed their eternity on Jesus by faith. God is not talking to the casual church member who is unbelieving. God's not talking to the wickedest, wicked person out there. He's saying, if my people, which are called by my name, we have to understand we, if you're a Christian, if you're born again this morning, that God is talking to you. If you've repented of your sin and unbelief and cast your soul upon the living Savior for salvation, God is talking to you this morning. Have you ever just said, yeah, there's some people who live their lives and say, oh, I just wish God would talk to me. Oh, I just wish I could hear from heaven. Brethren, God's already spoken, and it's in this book right here. And God is talking to us this morning. If you're in Christ, if you've repented of your sins and come to Jesus alone without the works of the law, he's saying, you. This is a promise for God's people in God's house this morning. We, it is so important to understand the audience. God, let me tell you something. God is not looking to the White House. God is not looking to the courthouse to fix the spiritual ills of this country. God isn't even starting with Hollywood or the social critics. Let me tell you, if we're going to have revival, if we're going to have healing, you know where it comes from? It starts in the church house. That's where, that's where it comes from. God's people are the ones being addressed here. And, on, and, I, and the more I consider how evil things are, I believe it is so evil because the church has neglected its responsibility. When a nation turns from God, we understand national problems occur. But when a church, a family, an individual turns and neglects Christ, it always 100% equals judgment. You look at this country where we're at and say, how is this even right? How is this gone as far this side or that side? How, how horrible is it now? You know, I've read things where they're talking about there's, there's a new uh, social push to make pedophilia okay. How can a society get as far to now the media saying, well, you know, I don't act on it, but it's okay for me to have those feelings. That's wicked. And society has gone unchecked because God's people have not stood up and said that is completely disgusting and wicked and evil. It is an abomination to God Almighty. It is time for the church, as our dear elected official said, stand up this morning. When we don't, it leads to drought, to defeat, to devastation. Well, you might say, well, preacher, I understand things are bad, but... I mean, it's getting better economically. Look at our military. Listen, I am thankful for this country. You're not going to find anybody else who bleeds red, white, and blue like me. But listen, a, a good economy, a, a good upward trend is a Flintstones bandage on a severed artery. Right. You catch that example? It, it'll do something, but it won't do much spiritually. I think we spend more time complaining than owning up to our responsibility. But if we want it, we got to get serious about it. And God is talking to his people this morning. Let me tell you, we need to be like, what, what was it, Samuel, who said, you know, when he was called and he said, here am I, right? He, he finally stood up to God's calling. Let me tell you, God, through his word, is calling his church to arise. God has given us a promise, right? He has given us a calling. And that actually, I want to move on to the next point. Number two, not a very long message, but the preparation involved. We understand who the people are, but what is the preparation of healing? The preparation involved. Notice, he says, if my people shall what? Humble themselves. One writer said it like this. He was a country boy. He said, pride is like the beaver's dam that flows, that keeps the flow of revival from coming down to us. Have you ever wondered why your spiritual life is as dry as dust? Pride could be the culprit, and I wonder if that's where we are spiritually. We are proud. But our first, new, our first duty in seeking a national revival, the healing of our land, is humility before an almighty God. 
You know, there's some people who, who, are, who are just puffed up in their knowledge. They're puffed up in their church attendance. Let me tell you something. As God's people, we need to humble ourselves before Almighty God. Now you say, well, hold on, preacher. How, how, how could a person be humble? Listen, when you understand who God is, he is a thrice holy God, an infinite, eternal God who is inflexibly just. The Bible says his eyes burn with a flame of fire, right? His face shineth like the sun in his strength. No man has seen God in his full revelation revelation and live right when 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 poor paul or saul caught him on the uh, on that road with with letters in his hands he caught just a glimpse of his glory and his eyes scaled over because of the glory let me tell you something when you understand how high and holy and exalted our god is and then you compare it against how wicked and undeserving and filthy and, and ungrateful and evil you are as a sinner automatically you are humbled before him Amen. Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6 the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, right? He saw the glory of the Lord and the seraphim and all these angels attending him. And he said, woe is me, for I am a man of un I'm a I am undone, right? I'm completely undone. God, I'm a man of unclean lips. When you see how wicked you are, your first reaction is to humble yourselves before God. Let me tell you something. Pride will keep you from revival. Well, I don't know if, if, if I should make a decision like that. That's pride. Pride will keep you from revival 100% of the time. Next, he says in this verse, he says, and pray and seek my face. Can I tell you, this is almost the most important. Actually, I would say this is the most important part if we're going to have revival. Prayer and seeking God. If you study all of the great revivals, they all started, catch this, with either one person or one small group of people getting together and saying, we need to pray for revival. Right. One person or a small group beseeching heaven, fasting and praying and asking God to send that reviving of life. Can I, can I give you a great example here? You may not like it, but it's great to me. Um, many of you have heard of the ministry of George Mueller. He was a wicked man who was saved and God changed his life. Mueller went on to become a man of great faith and prayer who started evangelistic works, missionary uh, enterprises, and orphanages. The crazy part was he had no money, <laughs> and he ran them all by faith and prayer. Imagine somebody comes to the city council meeting. I want to build a building. Great. Do you have financing? I have prayer. How quick is that going to go through, <laughs> right? But here's a man who says, I'm going to build an orphanage for God, and God provided everything that he needed. You know, I think about there's this, there's this awesome story. He's, he's got all these poor orphan children, and there's no government services back then. And he has, they don't have any food in the, orphanages, in the orphanage. So he has them prepare the table to put out plates in faith, and they, and they ask God to bless the food that isn't even there. You know what happens? On its way, a milk or food truck breaks down right in front of the orphanages. And in that day, if they couldn't get it from point B to the refrigeration, the food would spoil. So they heard a knock on the door. They had just finished. And Lord, thank you for the food that you provided. And then, amen. Excuse me, we've got all this food. We don't know what to do with it. We just broke down. Let me tell you, that, that is the type of prayer that this man knew. But here's, here's the crux of it, okay? But Mueller wrote a book called Answers to Prayer. And copies of that book made its way to Ireland. And in 1857, a young man named James McCorkin read that book. He went out and found a prayer partner. And over time, the group grew to four men. For a year, they'd pray every night for souls to be saved and for revival. Soon a person got saved. And then in February 1859, a spirit of revival broke out. This is historical. People crammed themselves into the church. So much that the people feared the balconies would collapse. The revival overflowed to the streets and spread to other churches and towns. Revival blazed through Ireland. It is estimated that a thousand people a day were converted. People were unable to sleep at night because they were under such conviction. Churches were packed at all hours. Divisions and conflicts evaporated. The jails were emptied. Amen. That's how you fix society's ills, right? Um, the jails were empty, and then the revival spread to England, Wales, and Scotland. It is called the Irish Revival of 1859, and in fact, 1859 became a year of revival around the world. Why? Let me tell you why. Because God's people got together and humbled themselves and prayed and sought God to do something, and God says, I'll honor that. 
You want God to change this city? You want God to change this state? You want God to heal this land? It's time for God's people to humble themselves, to take the proofs and the promises of Scripture, believe on them, and take it to heaven. Take it to the great white, take it to his throne of mercy and ask God to do these things. It is time for God's people to get serious, to get serious about the word of God, to get serious about reading and heeding it, to get serious about studying it. Commit yourself to live like a child of God, to get serious about his church and his works. I, I think about so many times in our, in our prayer life, how many times are our prayers prayerless say it again how many times in our spiritual lives are our prayers just prayerless they're repeated phrases that we've heard that we they're rope prayers honestly there's no vitality in them there's no seeking the throne of god if we're going to have revival we must pray like john knox who said lord give me scotland or i die do you want revival how bad how bad do you want it? Do you want us to do this? Dear Lord, send revival in our land, and God, please bless everybody. Amen. Do you want a revival like that, or do you want to hold the throne of grace and not leave until he blesses you? Do you want to be like, do you want to be like that, that Old Testament saint, right? Who, who, who uh, what was it? Uh, it was, um, who am I thinking of? Oh, my word. Israel, right? Israel, who held on to the, to, to, the, to the angel, right? And it would not let go until God blessed him. That's the type of prayer we're talking about. Not some rope prayer, not, dear God. God bless this, bless this. But, oh, God, send revival from heaven because if we don't have it, we're going to go about most miserable. Asking God, believing God, that's the type of prayer that we need. Now, and look at this other point. He says, and we have to turn from their wicked ways. Let me give you a principle. God will not turn unless you turn from your sin. If we regard iniquity in our heart, David said, the Lord will not hear me. Right? We understand if, 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 if we're... If we've got something in our hearts that's not life, that in our life that doesn't honor Christ, let me tell you something. If you do, you know it. The preacher doesn't have to tell you if there's something in your life that doesn't honor Christ. Because daily the Holy Spirit's saying, that's wrong. That's wrong. You're abusing the grace of God every time you ask for prayer and forgiveness, and then in your heart you want to just do it the very next day. If there is something in your heart, you better come to God and you better get that right. You better turn from your wicked ways and ask Christ to wash you, to cleanse you with his precious blood. If this land is going to be healed, you mark this down, you underline it in red, and you highlight it. If this land is going to be healed, God's people got to be holy. If this land is going to be healed, God's people have to turn from their wicked ways. God's people have to get right. Let me tell you something. There was a time when you could say, I'm a Christian, and people knew what that was. Now the, mud, the water is so muddied, and, you know, it, it, and a handshake doesn't mean what a handshake meant, right? Nobody keeps their word, and, 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 and it is so just blah and basic we need to basically be those people who know that we're saved right we need to live like it and people around us know it we need to we need to be holy and then lastly let me give you the promise from heaven number three the promise from heaven look at this it's a threefold promise let's go to our bibles here he says i will hear from heaven forgive their sin and will heal their land you know, our, I think our first reaction, I think the devil sometimes really likes to sow doubt, doesn't he? When we read a prayer like that, he immediately goes, do you really believe that? Come on, you? I mean, you're the only one who's going to pray for it. Is anybody else going to do it? Yeah, you're going to be that weird guy who says, pray for a revival, and everybody goes, ugh. That's the devil, right? Listen, I believe God's promises are true. Do you believe that God can produce another nationwide revival? I do, because my God is still ruling and reigning in heaven. All power is given unto him. My God is still able to answer prayer requests. He still upholds all things by his word of power. Let me tell you something. No matter what the devil tells you, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. If there is breath in your lungs and a measure of health in your body and you're saved, you can pray. You can beseech the throne of God. You can turn. You can be holy. Let me tell you something. Four people got together in 1859 and said, we believe God can do something. Four people. And it spread to multiple countries and that revival spread to the whole world. You want God to do something in this country? You must realize that we are the people being talked to. 
and we must realize that we have a responsibility, but you must realize that there is a promise to that. We need to take that promise by faith. We should be praying, God, give this, forgive this nation from its wickedness and heal our land. Now, some may sit here this morning and go, well, that's a nice thought, but I don't really think anything can change. Do you, do you realize that the spiritual decisions you make here in this church this morning have national ramifications? I believe that's what the scripture's saying. What if God is dealing with hearts here this morning because it's supposed to start in Newcastle? What if, what if it's the Newcastle revival of 2019? That's my God. That is the promise from heaven. Are we willing to take that promise and stand upon the rock of ages this morning? Some say, some may doubt, but I believe God. You read Second Chronicles and you can see this example over and over and over in Judah. There's a wicked king and then all of a sudden you have Hezekiah who shows up, does right, and God blesses. And there's revival in the land. It just takes one. It just takes one this morning, and we have a promise from heaven. But let me tell you, it's conditional based upon what God's people do with it. You must turn from your backslide. Let me tell you something. When we say turn, we're talking a full turn, not this half-hearted stuff. We know what we're talking about. Dear God, forgive me for this. And then in the back of our heart, we're like, I'm going to do that later. But God, if you forgive me, and God, I don't want to be under your judgment, and God, I don't really like being chastised, and God, I don't really like my peace being taken away, but God, if you could forgive me and give me peace for like a couple of days, and then I can do this one thing, that would be wonderful. That's half-hearted repentance. Let me tell you, half-hearted repentance is not repentance at all. We need to come to God and give our, uh, give our God our way and say, God, you have control. God, I'm turning from half-hearted obedience. I'm turning to a life of obedience. You know, I think sometimes in our, I think sometimes why we don't have revival is because we have the half-hearted prayers of Cain, the half-hearted prayers of Judas, the half-hearted prayers of Felix, where we feel bad about it, but there's never any real change. There's never any real change. Why, why are we where we are? Because we are not following the conditions of that promise. What are you doing with this promise this morning? Are you the problem or are you the solution? May God's holy presence drive us to our knees. May we pray and seek him and turn from our wicked ways. Can I give you an illustration this morning as we finish? And I think that's brought the most joy in, in the, most of the sermon this morning. <laughs> but when I was in seventh grade, I've told our church this. I compound fractured my, and I used to say fraction, you know. I fractured my arm where the bone went like that. And, of course, we had to go to the hospital. Um, and... I, you know, the doctor came in, and I don't really remember much of it, but it was fun. But how, how, how foolish would it be if the doctor was coming in with his assistant, and they've got the stuff to set it and to wrap it, if my mother stood in front of them and went, no, 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 I got it. What are you talking about? Oh, I watched it on, you know, ER. I, I, I could do this. That was a show back then. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I, 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 watched, I watched these doctors on TV do this, and I think I could do it. You know what she would do? She'd bring me a lot more hurt than healing. She doesn't know what she's doing. You know what the best thing she could do is? To get out of the way and let the doctor bring the healing. Right. Catch that? Can I, can I give you something I wrote down? Some of us need to get to an old-fashioned altar and get out of God's way. Jeez. We need to call upon the great physician to bring his healing. Do you want God to do something with this land? He's talking to you, Christian. Right. The born again, Bible believing, saved, washed in the blood, sin behind your back, sin cast as far as ways he's from the west. He's talking to you. But there's also a condition to that promise. You want God to heal this land? You want God to forgive their sins? You want God to bring back its zenith of spiritual glory again? Then it's going to start in the church house. It ain't, forgive the, forgive the bad vocabulary, it ain't going to start in the White House. Right. May God work on us as his children. Every head back. Hi, this is Pastor Ryan. I want to thank you for taking time to watch our video, and I really hope it was a blessing to you. Uh, if you found that it was a blessing, please do us a favor and share this video with your friends. And uh, if you are in the Newcastle, Indiana area, and you're looking for a church, or you're not involved in a church, and you would like to come check us out, I want to just personally invite you to do so, okay? I want to thank you for all of your time today, and I want to say God bless you. Thank you.